Good afternoon. Uh, thanks to all the organizers for uh, bringing us all together today. Um, as his father uh, played a central role in establishing the landscape architecture profession, Olmsted Jr. Uh, was a pivotal uh, individual in the creation of the city and regional planning profession in the United States. Um, Olmsted Jr. did this by institution building, um, by the establishment of the academic discipline of planning, through the creation of planning law, and through uh, his practice. Um, since we're in March Madness, uh, he was what we might call a quadruple threat. And many of you might have picked up that I'm not an Austin, Texas uh, native. Uh, I don't want to be a bad guest or anything. I'm from Dayton, Ohio. And um, I'm sorry, Stanford, but I'd really like to see the Dayton Flyers uh, beat Stanford this afternoon. That's probably a very rare time when that could possibly even happen. Uh, so Olmsted Jr. was um, a quadruple threat. Um, he was involved in the organization that would evolve into the American Planning Association. He helped found the first academic degree program in planning at Harvard. Uh, most planners are not aware that uh, early academic planning programs grew out of landscape architecture, first at Harvard, uh, then at the University of Illinois, and then at Berkeley. So planners have a lot to, to be in debt to landscape architects, and Ol Olmsted in particular. Uh, Olmsted Jr. helped write enduring laws, such as those for the National Park Service. And with his brother, John C., um, he was a quite active practitioner. And um, this image uh, shows uh, Baltimore, Maryland. And as has been noted before today, uh, President Teddy Roosevelt appointed Olmsted Jr. in 1901 to what would become known as the Macmillan Commission to create a plan for Washington, D.C. with Daniel Burnham, Charles uh, uh, McKim, and others. This plan would significantly influence what became uh, what we call now the City Beautiful Movement. And in Olmsted Jr.'s view, uh, City Beautiful was not merely decoration, but essentially a way of organizing the elements uh, of a city so they were both functional and aesthetically pleasing. Building on the work of uh, their father, the Olmsted brothers uh, undertook numerous metropolitan park system plans, greenways, and city plans across the nation. Uh, I want to thank Peter Pollack, who loaned me some of the next uh, few slides of uh, Boulder, Colorado. And today, we're, we've been focusing uh, on California. Uh, but in this introduction, I wanted to say just a few words about Olmsted Jr.'s work in Boulder and elsewhere in Colorado. Uh, beginning in 1907, Olmsted Jr. became involved in the plans to expand the parks, boulevards, and general civic improvements in Boulder. Um, and this plan was published, as you can see, in 1910. Uh, and in the plan, in the plan, uh, Olmsted Jr. quotes uh, from Denman W. Ross's theory of pure design, we aim at order and hope for beauty. And again, I want to thank Peter Pollack for that quote. From the, this beginning um, in Boulder, um, they undertook several more detailed plans, uh, the Olmsted brothers for uh, Boulder. Uh, and today, um, Boulder is indeed a beautiful city, and much of what defines it, such as the Boulder Greenway system, uh, can be traced back uh, to Olmsted Jr. Uh, Boulder was Olmsted Jr.'s first client in Colorado, Colorado. Ultimately, he would make plans for the city of Denver, the Denver Mar uh, Mountain Park system, which is quite amazing, Colorado Springs and Colorado College. Uh, and before introducing um, our panel of speakers, 
I'd like to add a brief acknowledgement of this man, another sort of unsung hero today, and this is Charles Elliott Jr., who worked with Olmsted Sr. and was the son of Harvard University's president. Uh, with Olmsted Sr. and Vox's park system plans, which we saw a Buffalo, but also an amazing plan for Brooklyn, uh, Elliott Jr.'s metropolitan approach to open space planning pre-staged and laid the groundwork uh, for Olmsted Jr. and John C.'s work. Uh, Ol uh, Elliott Jr. also pioneered a natural systems approach or an ecological approach through uh, his collaboration on the Emerald Necklace, but also the work that he did in Mount Desert Island in uh, Maine. Uh, unfortunately, um, we don't know uh, more about Elliott Jr. because he died prematurely. I guess we all die prematurely, but he... <laughs> He died prematurely at a younger age. Um, and in his honor, his uh, father uh, established the Charles Elliott Professorship in Landscape Architecture, um, a professorship that was first held by Olmsted uh, Jr. So Elliott, um, the Elliott family, in many ways, uh, complement the contributions that the Olmsteads made, and they certainly should be acknowledged as well. Uh, our panel looking at metropolitan parks, I'm going to ask them not to sit up here all the time, but just to come up one at a time. Uh, first is um, uh, uh, William Deverall, who you uh, met this morning, and then he'll be followed by uh, Robert uh, Doyle from the East Bay uh, Regional uh, Park District, and then uh, Greg Heiss from the University of Nevada at um, Las Vegas. So William, if you'll come up first. And then uh, we will, uh, each of the others will come up uh, and, and turn, and then we'll all come back together. Thank you. Um, my task here this afternoon is to revisit and reprise that masterful parks, be uh, parks playgrounds, and beaches for the Los Angeles region plan of the late 20s, which was killed off at the dawn of the Great Depression, to do some of the lineage with the firm that led up to the contract and the client uh, relationship with the firm. Uh, and then there'll be an interlude as we go north to the East Bay. And then my colleague and friend, Greg Heiss, are you going to go next? Perfect. OK. So there won't be an interlude. Uh, I will immediately um, uh, give over the podium to my dear friend and colleague, Greg Heiss, who's going to pick up the story of the Olmsted vision for greater Los Angeles and Los Angeles County since the killing off of the plan at the dawn of the Great Depression to talk about its piecemeal, in many respects, um, revisit in the intervening 80 years or so. So with that, let me go over some of the precursor moments. Um, Los Angeles roars into national prominence in the generation after the Civil War with railroads and largely citrus and other agricultural growth of the latter 19th century. In that period, in the latter 19th century, there seems to be at least momentarily plenty of water uh, for Southern California that um, embraces a, a fairly large and ambitious uh, moment of metropolitan growth. In that period, where Los Angeles, in its most ambitious, boosterous, entrepreneurial sense, uh, begins to um, believe firmly that it will eclipse San Francisco as the state's most prominent uh, metropolitan region, and begins to set its sights on eclipsing Chicago, and trying to do what Chicago had done from the second half of the 19th century, roaring into uh, global prominence, really. So Los Angeles is ambitious in that regard. Um, it's led by a series of ambitious metropolitan officials and private voices. At that moment, the latter 19th century, an early visit to the Olmsted firm, to Olmsted Sr., is made. And this, is, um, this comes from a letter um, from one of these figures envisioning a certain future for Los Angeles. Uh, a letter is written to Olmsted Sr. Uh, would you possibly come out and be interested in helping Los Angeles design a particular park, uh, essentially the, the, the landscape very close and proximate to Dodger Stadium today? Um, would you come out and help us think about that? And, if not an articulated vision of connection, at least some kind of plan for that park space. And the Olmsted firm very, very quickly says no. Um, you're, essentially says you're not big enough for us and you don't have enough money. Uh, the response is very, uh, it's almost gruff, really. So that moment goes. 
Uh, overture B, the next overture, a really remarkably interesting letter that's written to Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. in the summer of 1914 by this, um, I'm, I'm assuming, and Greg and I assume, a quite remarkable person um, about whom we know very little, but a private citizen named Kate Bassett who writes to Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. in the summer of 1914 and essentially says, again, could you come out, but in a much grander vision, could you come out and help us plan for uh, transit arteries, articulated green space uh, planning for the large expanse of, if not LA County at that moment, at least LA City. And in doing so, she's put her uh, fingers at, uh, atop the, some of the leading planning figures. You can recognize the Mulholland name there as well. Dana Bartlett is a prominent social reformer and uh, clergyman, and the others are planners. By and Ar Arnold comes from Chicago as a civil engineer and urban planner. And she's put her fingers on those figures and said essentially to the Olmsted for come, out, come on out, work with them, and let's think about a big vision for Los Angeles. And what characterizes this moment, as well as the one I'm going to get to in a minute, which leads to the plan, is an understanding at that moment that time is of the essence, that the basin, though big and vast and for our eyes today uh, entirely open, but nonetheless filling in, though the basin was, basin was big and vast, time was of the essence, could you help us come, essentially what Seattle had done, grab hold of space, make it public, and plan it uh, now. Um, the Olmsted firm thinks about this, Frederick Law Olmsted, uh, engages in a conversation uh, by correspondence with Kate Bassett, and eventually the firm decides no, uh, we're not going to do this. Uh, busy enough, presumably, you're on your way, you're an upstart city, you're on your way, and for implicitly more or less says, get back to us in 10 or 15 years, which is precisely what happens. So in the latter 1920s, uh, the Los Angeles Chamber of Commerce spins off a, a citizens committee uh, of wealthy individuals, peopled and populated, uh, perhaps most prominently by Hollywood wealth. Uh, Douglas Fairbanks, Mary Pickford play a very strong role in this, Saul Lesser, uh, Mr. Lemley, Mr. Goldwyn, and others, very strong presence in this, putting up a lot of money. Another appeal is made to the Olmsted firm, could you come out and help us plan a very, very large uh, plan for the entire county of Los Angeles stretching from the coast all the way into the deserts of approaching Riverside and San Bernardino counties from north to south. Could you build an articulated green space that utilizes what's already on the landscape but also grabs by, via purchase or eminent domain vehicles other uh, land, other opportunities for smaller and larger parks, beaches, and playgrounds? Uh, from the very small scale of bridle paths, walking paths, up to the vast scale of things like already on the landscape Griffith Park. At this point, the Olmsted firm says yes. They come out, um, they partner with Harlan Bartholomew of St. Louis, they partner with local experts on the ground, and over the course of several years, they produce, which I showed before in my little prop, they produce this magnificent plan. Um, the, the scale here is a little tough to read. Um, the, let me make sure I know exactly what I'm talking about here. That's, that's what's present in um, green space when they come out in great, greater LA County. That's the Boston Emerald Necklace laid atop LA County. You can see they're working from it graphically as well as in terms of inspiration and scale. There's their plan. Red and green are both green space uh, articulations across that landscape. Um, much like we heard in the Buffalo movie at lunchtime, the notion was you're always proximate to some access to the articulated space. You're always very close by walking, perhaps a short drive, perhaps a bicycle, perhaps even on horseback or um, trolley transit. You're always close to getting some access to the green space planning that would take you onto the beaches, out to the deserts, into the Santa Monica's, into the San Gabriel Valleys, to your local playground, to your local park, to your local bridle path, et cetera. And it was not, um, it was uh, remarkably democratic in terms of the ways it's spaced and laid across the landscape and the socioeconomic diversity of greater Los Angeles. What's really um, come of it, and Greg will probably speak to this uh, eventually here when I turn over the podium to him, what's come of it in many respects is the articulated vision of it all has now in some respects devolved or transitioned in the intervening 80, 75 years or so to an articulated vision of the Los Angeles River as the main spine of environmental sensitivity and planning in Los Angeles. We've lost, because the basin is filled in, because the land has been privatized, et cetera, we've lost the opportunity to do this in any grand scale like the Olmsted firm envisioned it. 
And as I said this morning, essentially what happens is Frederick Olmsted literally challenges the Chamber of Commerce clients and says, are you sure you want us to plan that big? Are you sure you're, gonna, you're putting up a lot of money? Do you want us to plan that big? Do you want a, a plan that can be executed? And his clients tell, them, tell the firm yes. And so Olmsted Jr. and his confederates in the planning process create a three-part plan. One is the landscape architecture itself. One is the fiscal and bonded vehicles by which you pay for it, tens of millions of dollars. And the third is how do you govern it? Because as you can see in the greater Los Angeles area, that's a multi-jurisdictional entity across the landscape of uh, dozens and dozens and dozens of municipalities, county governments, city governments, et cetera. You have to have a super jurisdictional governance body with probably law enforcement capabilities um, and also the oversight of the funding to govern that thing. You need a big um, uh, jurisdictional body created new that would govern it. And that's the moment where it trips up. That's a precisely the moment where the Chamber of Commerce Committee and particularly the Chamber of Commerce Executive Body, a group of about 40 leaders in the commerce and uh, political scene of Los Angeles and Los Angeles County of the era, turn on the plan. Turn on the plan that they had birthed. And they turn on it and say, essentially, we're not ceding power to something new. We are the big commercial and even political power on the landscape. The great irony of that is it's at the dawn of the Great Depression where within four, five, six, seven years, Los Angeles will change radically by the infusion of New Deal monies, by federal officers, federal authorities, et cetera. The Chamber of Commerce will lose its authority on the landscape by virtue of the New Deal transitions. But before they see that happen, they fight the super jurisdictional invention of the Olmsted firm. And the plan is, it's, uh, the, when the plan is launched, the arrival of this into publication gets a brief mention in the local press, and then it goes away. Uh, and it goes away um, only to be resurrected in piecemeal quality for the most part in the, in the remaining, or, uh, main, remaining decades of the 20th century. Okay, um, and then the last moment is this remarkable in, uh, uh, characterization by a member of the Chamber of Commerce who launched the committee that hired the Olmsted firm in the first place. And so you get this kind of defensive legitimation of what we've done to kill this thing off. So it's really a remarkable statement of uh, the rise of expectation and then dashed uh, against the shoals of what I said this morning was petty and even spiteful behavior on the part of the Chamber of Commerce. Okay, so there's your backdrop for it. Um, uh, Dean Steiner, would you like me to introduce Greg? Okay. Um, my friend and colleague and um, uh, co-author and co-editor on a number of projects, the very, very talented Greg Heiss from the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. All right. As Bill intimated, uh, Parks, Playgrounds, and Beaches is a product of big thinking, but it's also just a plain big plan. And let me, let me just suggest a couple of ways. One has to do with geography. It's a plan for 1,500 square miles. Another has to do with the process. The Olmsted and Bartholomew firms believe strongly in the Gedzian principle of survey before you plan. So one of the images I'm showing you here on the upper right is actually a survey of all the, all the lots that have been plotted for urban development in greater Los Angeles in 1930, right? So keep in mind, it's a, it's a big and growing city, as Bill suggested, but it's a city that could grow 60% in addition to its current population without laying out another parcel of land, without entitling another lot, right? So they're surveying all those kinds of conditions. And so survey, analysis, and then outreach. And all this, as Bill suggested this morning, takes three years. It's big in terms of its comprehensiveness. As he mentioned, the financing, the governance, this is all part of what they see as the plan. It's big in plan in terms of scope, from playgrounds to municipal parks to regional parks, from the boulevard to the, to the parkway to the highway. What I'm showing you on the lower right is one of their images of one of those parkways, one of those planted boulevards, in this case leading from Palos Verdes to downtown, right? Um, so the report, as one of our reviewers suggested, is a model of ambitious, intelligent, regional, and ecological thinking. And as Bill recounted also this morning, our book Eden by Design is an exploration of why the chamber suppressed it. Well, the report now serves as a primary source for understanding a past that's, van that's vanished, as well as routes that may have been taken and led to a different present. The former evokes nostalgia, and so people have written about parks, playgrounds, and beaches as a kind of Eden lost. The latter, however, invokes what-ifs or ifs-onlys, and, and this is we, we're entering into the realm here of counterfactual investigation or counterfactual speculation, which historians are loath to do, but let me try a little. 
To mention one, consider the timing. Um, so here I'm showing on the upper left what the Los Angeles River looked like as a river. On the lower left, uh, a progressive era park, East Lake Park in Los Angeles. And there were a number of these, MacArthur Park as well, which is Westlake initially. On the upper right, what I'm showing is how the Arroyo Seco was built during the Depression, right, when it becomes a channel to carry off the water, as opposed to what the Olms has imagined that it could be a seasonal run runoff. Right? And other times you could drive along that, that bed. And on the right, uh, lower, excuse me, the lower right, we all know Carrie McWilliams' phrase is factories in the field, in which he's talking about corporate agriculture. But literally in Southern California, the factories are in the fields. Right? So agriculture and, and material production uh, coincide or coexist on the landscape. So as Bill mentioned, this is right at the cusp, 1930, of a transition from a decade of, of enormous growth in aviation and oil and other, in, in, in the movie industry, right? The 20s was a, was a boom period in Southern California, immediately followed by the Great Depression. So if it had been produced three or five years later, it could have served as a blueprint for New Deal public works. So imagine the CCC constructing trails. Imagine the Public Work Administration engineering pleasure parkways, right? This is all what we talk about now is shovel ready. This is a plan that was good to go. So the timing matters a lot. Another kind of big thinking underlay Eden, our book, uh, in, in terms of, the, uh, of, of a hope, a hope that that republication might lead to or engender a public conversation. When we were planning the project around 2000 or so, it seemed immodest to expect that. It still does today in some ways. But fate smiled on us. We have fortune of timing ourselves in this case. And due to a number of factors, what had been a keepsake became a primer. And this is why I think about it as an afterlife of a master plan. So we had to go very quickly from explaining why the plan was never put into a place to articulating its prospects, uh, excuse me, its prospects, how it might actually be uh, uh, incrementally implemented. And the reasons and the rationales, I think, uh, map very closely on the events of 70 years ago. So then and now, people consider and study Los Angeles as a county that is talked about as park poor relative to other cities. Then, advocates for open space were surveying conditions. They do so now. Then and now, people map access and calculate the park area, uh, the park acreage of, of Los Angeles County by the per capita population. Now, we also map by inequity and income and race ethnicity, which is what the map I'm showing you on the lower uh, right hand side um, does in this case. And so, in this sense, park play playgrounds and beaches, that 1930 report, has, be has begun to serve as technical evidence for, in this case, for public interest law offices that are challenging the inequity of park access in Los Angeles County. And we can also think about the current iteration or the current use of the plan in terms of governance and its political component as well. Activists in public health and advocates in other domains are a constituency that actually votes. And so in the mayoral campaign of the early 2000s, both uh, Antonio Villaraigosa and, 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 and his, uh, his challenger, Han, strove to outdo each other as proponents of park planning. So there were actual uh, mayoral uh, uh, debates both of them were waving around copies of the plan and trying to outdo each other, right? And this is exactly the support that the, the Olmsteads and Bartholomew couldn't muster in 1930, but they had it in 2000. So keep that in mind as you're writing reports. It might take 70 years, but it might take place, right? There's also, of course, important economic and resource components. Voters statewide in California had approved legislation to tax themselves. So Prop 12 passed in March of 2000 by 63%. Right? So $2.1 million became available for park improvements and coastline maintenance. As you would anticipate, funds attract attention. And so that's one of the reasons why these, these mayoral candidates were waving around the report. There's also, as other people have mentioned today, a positive history of return on these kinds of investments. So in 1893, the Seattle Park Commissioners asserted confidently that park cities become centers toward which money flows. And so we can think about public space as a kind of magnet. And this is true today. Think of Millennium Park in Chicago. Think of the High Line in New York City, right? Think of the ads, have you seen these ads for 157, this condominium complex in New York, right? People are competing to pay $90 million for penthouse uh, uh, condos. Why? Because you have a direct axial view from the south to the north of Central Park. I mean, if that isn't talking about the economic value of park planning, I'm not, I'm not making a case for $90 million condos. Uh, that said, the value of that land has increased dramatically because of its proximity to the park. Well, in the 1930s, people were talking about unchecked development in Los Angeles County as threatening the goose and the golden egg. And that's what some of what Olmsted and Bartholomew were looking at when they were putting together that plan. And many people still talk about the, the goose and the golden egg today. 
80 years ago, what the chamber talked about as the best brains in the nation, conjured a plan, a metropolitan ideal that showed a state of the field thinking for urban design and landscape architecture at the time. Might that vision inspire planners today? Let me suggest that it has and it might continue to. Here I'm showing you on the left um, a rendering of the plan for the El Monte Transit Way, which I'll talk about in a moment, and on the lower left, uh, uh, a photograph of that facility. Notice the bicycles, and right, because it's a multimodal center here. And on the right, I'm showing you a, a, a plan and two renderings for the cornfields, that state historic park. This, again, is all about connections and linkages, right? Preserve, what was it? Oh, protect and connect. I love that from, from an earlier presentation, right? So you're protecting the landscape, but you're also connecting things in it as well. Um, as Bill mentioned, the Los Angeles River has come to serve as a key site for environmental reimaginings of greater Los Angeles. Not so for, the, for Olmsted and Bartholomew. It was just one water course, right? There's also the San Gabriel River and the Rio Hondo. And so they incorporated the entire county, so it's three water courses in their case, right? They're thinking systematically again and, 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 uh, and uh, comprehensively. So the El Monte Transit Center uh, has a bikeway, and so you can literally bike all along the Rio Hondo, but at this point you can get off the bikeway, park your bike, and get onto public transit, right? Which is a way of bringing people out to parks and using public transit um, as a way of doing that. Um, well, it's one among a host of recent park projects. Um, Cornfields, a consortium of designers, uh, a recreation of a putative public landscape is a pedestrian linkage between downtown Los Angeles, uh, El Pueblo, and the Los Angeles River, where a lot of that restoration kinds of work is going on. But we could also look at an example like Grand Park, um, here by Rios Clemente Hale, and this is a city beautiful plan, right? It, it, it's, it's a great public fora for citizens of Los Angeles in front of City Hall. Right, so it works, it, it, it addresses that part of their thinking as well. Or we could look at smaller pocket parks in a city like uh, Glendale, for instance. So here's Adams Square, um, where the city is you know, capitalizing on any remnant space. Right? It's impossible to do the big plan at this point. But let's do little parts of it, and we can link all of these things together. Or closer to downtown, downtown Los Angeles, we have Vista Mosa Park, a joint venture between LA Parks, the LA Parks, uh, the city's park planning um, uh, institution, and the Santa Monica Conservancy. Um, so here we see the governance component. It's a joint pro, uh, public and not-for-profit enterprise. The author of a Los Angeles Times review of this park from August of 2012 closed their essay with a reference to parks, playgrounds, and beaches. In 1930, the author tells us, the Olmsted brothers, sons of Frederick Law Olmsted, who designed New York Central Park, that's always the tagline, right? Urged the LA Chamber of Commerce to set aside 70,000 acres of pleasure ways from the mountains to the Pacific. The city fathers ignored them then, but it's not too late to reclaim some of that lost legacy. Again, time is of the essence. Now is the time to act. So it's up to all of us to act as professional and as citizen planners to ensure that the afterlife of this plan continues well into the future. Well, parks, playgrounds, and beaches, to my mind, is many things. But one of those things is that it's a case study. It's good to think with. So let me suggest six lines of inquiry, six things we might think about using this plan as our, uh, as our gist. The first is municipal metropolitan uh, ambition. As Bill mentioned, these are, you know, they're hired by place promoters, right? The whole idea is to distinguish yourself from other American cities, to say that we are the city. And I think we, see, we still see that today. Another aspect is public, private, and not-for-profit enterprise, right? We always see those as being separate kinds of enterprises. But, uh, people who work in public administration talk about a third way, bringing all of those together. When they talk about this, they have about a 10-year time horizon. Here's an example from at least seven decades ago where that was the case. That's how these folks were operating. And I think we can learn from, from that process um, as well. A third line of inquiry has to do with the implementation, which I've, as, you, as you know and I've already suggested was partial. But let's, let's face it, it's always going to be when you plan this big. I mean, when Olmsted was drawing up Central Park, he didn't imagine to see it all grown out in his lifetime, right? These are long-term kinds of projects. So the gap between the plan and the realization is always there, and it's intrinsic when we plan big. Another line of inquiry might be the une uneven distribution of power and authority. That's kind of, that's what, what Bill was saying, undid the plan in some ways, right? But there's always gonna be differential power. And that's true in Los Angeles and other cities as well. We can use park playgrounds and beaches to think about histories of the professions. 
Uh, as people have already suggested, the Olmstead brothers were on the leading edge of what we might now consider national practice, right? Uh, there's only a few firms in the 19-teens and 1920s that are working at that scale, that have these branch offices with Charles Cheney and others located strategically around the country so they can, they can handle projects all over at a time when you're not faxing and, and sending things at PDFs, right? Um, as old Lori Olin uh, described to us in the afterword for, part, for Eden by Design, I mean, Olmsted is literally working here on the Stanford campus, taking the train across the nation, writing, handwriting his reports, getting back there and then sending it off to, you know, to, to whomever, working on some projects and coming this way and, and working on it again or working on a different project, right? It's a way to conduct a national practice at that time. A big line of inquiry is the significance of the West for American planning. If you go through the Olmsted papers, California is fourth, fifth, or sixth in at least six categories of the master plan uh, or the office uh, list of master, the master list of plans. There's a significant number of projects in Colorado in Oregon, and Washington, and Western Canada. And these are often big projects, subdivision and suburban communities, parkways and recreation areas, city and regional planning, and municipal improvement projects. There's also the geographic scale. Remember, Bill's, uh, Bill showed us the plan of the emerald necklace laid over Los Angeles County, and it barely captures the county. Right? So all this is different in the West. The timing of development is different. The scale of the, the, the cities are different. Dense concentrations with real open space. I mean, when you leave Boston, you don't travel for a couple of hours before you see development again. But in the West, you do. So let me close, close by suggesting that, of course, big plans are out of favor. And they have been for at least a few generations. But I think perhaps we toss the baby out with the paradigm shift to community-based bottom-up planning. Yet there's no corresponding shrinkage in the issues that we seek or we need to address. Concentrated poverty, durable inequity, resource depletion, a warming climate, these are all things that I think require big plans. Now in that context, parks may seem like a nicety or could be perhaps dismissed as being too little and perhaps too late. On the contrary, parks promote economic development. They can enhance our quality of life. They can add incrementally or at least on the margins to carbon capture. So here's my concluding point. The Olmstedian legacy is vibrantly alive when we make big plans rather than relegate that scale to the past. Thank you. I am Robert Doyle, General Manager of East Bay Regional Park District. It's a pleasure to be here this afternoon, and it's been a long day, so I will try to keep this uh, moving along. I think uh, after our prior speakers, it's a, a good perspective that this is this is the little plan that uh, Olmsted didn't want to do, and now it's the big plan that was a success. So I think the context is, is very interesting in trying to look at what we've seen today. East Bay Regional Park District was created in, uh, 80 years ago, and so we're very proud of the, the lineage of uh, Olmsted. But I want to go back to um, and, and I can't help but uh, offend anybody from Stanford because a great deal of this story is about UC Berkeley. It's about the university estate at Berkeley. And um, I will connect those dots for you. And it goes all the way back to Olmsted Sr. And I also want to thread through here that in any successful park effort, there's a lot of luck involved. So. It just so happened that uh, Olmsted, after the Civil War, senior, was uh, managing the Mariposa State in the Sierras. Had he not been there, two things wouldn't have happened. The plan for the UC, the idea of a park system above the UC campus, because it was originally his idea when he came out of the Sierras. The UC, uh, he was looking for work around the Bay Area, and he did um, several projects in the Bay Area. And he uh, helped with the layout and landscape design for use, the new estate of the University of California at Berkeley. And when he did that, um, as this picture kind of shows, he got up into the hills and saw a fantastic view of San Francisco Bay um, to the west of the campus, out to the Golden Gate. And he even suggested in 1866 that there should be a set of hill parks and there should be a parkway in the hill parks. 
because that would improve the economic value of the real estate in the East Bay. You heard that theme earlier about the economic value of parks. So that idea disappeared. In the meantime, uh, his plan that he drafted, his 8,000 word plan for Yosemite Valley um, was buried, uh, disappeared as they said, but not to Olmsted Jr. And that really, I think, connected the dots of the city parks that were going on at the time in his mind and these big natural parks. He was invited to participate with the first uh, commission, and that commission actually was the one who killed the plan. Whitney, uh, the Whitney Party and the Geologic Survey um, did not want that to distract from funding the rest of the Geologic Survey. So both money and controversy because Senior's plan was also to improve what was going on in that new state park in the valley because it was being taken over by concessionaires and being taken over by sheep herders and woodcutters and so that became controversial. He had that conservation ethic at that time. So the next step in the process was Olmsted Jr. who incorporated some of the same thought and thinking that we went over today earlier, but I wanted to reference the Organic Act because the mentor of, of Stephen Mather was John Muir. He, he talks about John Muir quite a bit. And uh, you, you saw earlier that in the language to create the first federal park system was the same language of words like enjoyment for future generations, but first and foremost to protect the scenery. And that is consistent through their plans. So there was disappointment in the Yosemite plan by Olmsted Sr., but the idea, although went away for an East Bay Park, still had the national park movement. And we're going to go back to the national parks uh, because there is a direct connection to the East Bay plan as part of that. One of the things that Mather talked about and is quoted in a, the first ranger in Sequoia and the first chief naturalist of the National Park Service was Ansel Hall. Ansel Hall ended up at UC Berkeley with an office of the national parks there. And in, in 1920, Hall wrote his first guide to Yosemite Valley for the National Park Service. And in that, he said that there were three factors that were really critical to the new federal system and again, consistent with the Olmsted philosophy, maintain the unimpaired landscape for future generations. It should be set apart for use and observation for health and leisure and pleasure of the people. And going back to the concern of Olmsted Sr. in, in mid-1860s, was that the National Park Service should control, have the full control and authority to manage what happens within these lands, concessionaires, uh, business agreements, any of those things. And I think those are very important to make sure that those areas aren't, aren't spoiled. So Olmsted had a key, Junior had a key, very key role in the formation of the National Parks. And that relationship with Olmsted Jr. in Yosemite and the National Parks continued for 50 years. I think with the details, this is a 1933 picture of the Wawona Tunnel. And this massive tunnel that was designed to frame and protect the landscape looking into Yosemite Valley, think about all the rock that came out of that tunnel, blasted out of that tunnel. It was going to get shoved down the hillside. And Olmsted advising National Parks says, no, you should utilize every bit of that and you can utilize it by what is the now famous parking lot uh, below that everyone takes their first shots, their first big views of Yosemite Valley. So that consistent, pragmatic, studied design approach with the conservation pr approach is threaded through all of these, these issues. Now we move to the specifics of the East Bay. So the East Bay Regional Park plan really is different because this was not private property. Uh, former Governor 
George Pardee who became uh, president of the Water District Board. They built the first big reservoir in the Sierras, and they had acquired a lot of watershed, water, private water company land in the East Bay Hills. Mr. Pardee said, well, we bought a lot of land we didn't need, so we're going to surplus a lot of that land. Hence, the horse race started. Um, there was a proposal from leaders at UC Berkeley and community that some of that land should be a park. Where did that idea come from? That first idea by Olmsted Senior, where did that come from? Somebody had to have had it in the, in the writings. It got discussed in the community for years and, and said these, these par this park idea should not go away. So um, Olmsted was asked by a very key figure in park history and also for Save the Redwoods Leagues and State Park by Duncan McDuffie. Duncan McDuffie was a very successful real estate developer in San Francisco and the East Bay, but he also served as chair of Save the Redwoods League and the first committee to establish the state park. He had worked with Olmsted Jr. on other plans, and he asked, um, he was close to the governor at that time, and he asked if it would be possible to get Mr. Olmsted paid to do the state park survey. So the state park survey comes into contact with Mr. McDuffie. And it becomes Mason McDuffie Real Estate, for those of you who know Bay Area Real Estate, very big, successful real estate company. A mountain climber, a conservationist, the president of the Sierra Club, also a very, very uh, successful businessman. Olmsted writes back, I'm too busy, this is too small of a plan, I'm exhausted, I had the, I've had the, the, the huge undertaking with the State Park Survey, and, and says no. De, uh, McDuffie says, well, we're going to keep trying, and so they talk to the, the friends, uh, a very key person in our history is um, Robert Sibley uh, from from a professor at UC Berkeley. They're all connected, they're all talking, so we have this university effort. And so they, they don't give up. And they write another letter and they ask. And so at that time, Ansel Hall is at UC Berkeley running the National Park Service Western Region and their educational program. And so Sibley and McDuffie say, if we can get Ansel Hall from the National Park Service to survey and detail the possibility of a, a park system in those hills to be worthy, would Olmsted put their name on a cooperative plan? And it happened. So a 10,000 acre survey of potential parks in the East Bay Hills was proposed. It's called the, the Olmsted Hall Report. Again, another collaboration. And there's Ansel Hall doing a scale map of Yosemite Valley, a young man then. But he basically came in charge of the Western National Parks and of all the education programs for the National Parks. So the East Bay Regional Park District idea had a collaboration of one of the first and, and greatest national park leaders, but also Olmsted. So it, that plan was very modest, but um, Hall's position was that was really worthy of a park system. They were really looking at one big park along the hills. And so they developed that plan and very inex inexpensively. And from there on, it became a proposal that the citizens took on. So you had the leadership of a leading university. You had the leadership of the business community, different than Los Angeles, who continued to champion the idea of a park in the East Bay Hills. And what is also different, but similar to state parks, the state park plan was the, the seed of proposing the first state park bond in California. That bond was a $6 million park bond that was voted on after Olmsted's plan was finished. And it required a 50% match of private philanthropic donations of land or money and that's what went to the voters. So they, from the very beginning of the state park system, you had this model of 
both private donations helping the state park system and the public taxing themselves. And, and that went forward, as did our measure. Uh, and you can see in the middle there, that is Hall, and again with a relief map that we're trying to restore, we do have a copy of it, of the East Bay Hills above Oakland and Berkeley, and key figures there. So in the depth of the Depression, we had the luck of two key figures and a lot of key academic and business leaders in the East Bay to push this. It went to the voters, it was successful, it was the first regional park of its kind um, in the state of California, required new legislation uh, to create the park system. And from then on, we ended up uh, the negotiations with East Bay Mud to buy this property, that's what the money was for in the bond measure, was to buy it from East Bay Mud. Charles Tilden and Pardee had a great time arguing about how much money and how much acres would be um, acquired through that. The interesting sidebar for me was that Charles Tilden was able to help get some of the WPACCC money from the federal government, again, with Hall heading up a lot of that CCC planning and work at um, UC Berkeley, got a million dollars uh, to help start building the park. And this is one of the first times, something we try not to do in the park business, is they started building the park before they actually acquired it from East Bay Mud. So I guess the, the, the message there is they couldn't say no. Uh, they were already building the park. Um, but uh, a really great celebration and uh, the effort began to acquire and build these parks and the funding was there because of the same issues you heard with state parks and national parks of the, 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 the work program administration and CCCs were there to, we had six camps in the East Bay building those parks. It really was a, a, again a luck uh, of, of, of a very, very bad economy and the desire to put people to work, which is what we should have been doing uh, recently, putting people to work in parks, and there they are working. The eucalyptus trees were planted as part of the water company uh, efforts. There's, there's a mistake. Um, we even had the WPA, uh, I don't see it in the male workers there, um, but the WPA, and this will be one of our treats tomorrow night uh, for the East Bay tour, and reception is this was this waterfall was built by the WPA and had not been operable for many years, basically um, broken down. And so we have restored that as a part of our 80th anniversary as a donation from our foundation. So um, that should be flowing tomorrow. And so we continue to make these parks along the Oakland Hills. And what we've seen throughout the years uh, is that we now have about 22 million visitors a year to our system. We are not in the position where we have to really work hard to get um, a diverse uh, community and, and cultural diversity in our system. They love our parks, they're par our partners and our citizens and our parks are very busy and are very colorful and diverse uh, both naturally and um, as far as the demographics. So we are very pleased about uh, the support we get from and use from the public. But uh, you can see some of the early ideas of promoting the park system, um, but still preserving the majority of that land through that plan says, first and foremost, uh, preserve the land, acquire the land, preserve the land, and then plan it for the recreational use that uh, is gonna come. Um, Olmstead uh, Senior predicted that someday Lots of people would come, at least a few hundred, um, or a few thousand, and now we're looking at millions. So the next kind of big step that I want to reference, and it is, it is relevant to today, is that uh, William Penn Mott became our director in the 60s. He went on to be the state park director, and then he went on to the national parks, to be the national park director. He was a landscape architect. And he looked at the park system from a landscape architect's eyes of what we should be doing. But he had kind of three core things that he brought to the park district in the 60s. The professionalization of, of staff, the educational department through interpretation was a, a Bill Mott addition. Um, the, the continuing expansion and preservation of, of parks and landscape 
and the development of facilities that are appropriate for that park system. And if you think about those goals, those goals are very similar to what Mather was talking about, what Olmsteads were talking about, is a professional level, good data, good planning, the educational component of, of parks. Bill Mott's quote, I, and I think I said it earlier, but uh, I, I think about it every day, and I think about from what uh, General Jackson said today, was his quote was, getting, getting money for parks was like squeezing water out of rocks. And Mather's big concern in the National Park Service was that this fledging new federal park, federal system would not prevail. That it, they, he got, they passed the Organic Act, but they did not get any money from Congress repeatedly. So he reached out to the railroads, he reached out to business people, he really promoted the parks. There's been some criticism of that, but first and foremost, he was there as a John Muir disciple to preserve these lands. But he knew they would not be preserved if the public would not embrace and see those lands. So this, this, this constant issue of providing public access and also preserving that land is just, is, is throughout this theme, is, is the struggle of parks. So today, uh, the district is 114,000 acres, a far cry from the 10,000 acres that was originally proposed. Um, we have um, a trail system that actually interconnects all of our 65 parks to the communities in between parks. Fairly unique in the nation that way. But an Olmsted thought of connections of greenways and trails and access. So the new master plan that we just approved last year uh, includes further expansion of the system consistent with, with uh, the Bill Mott uh, philosophy and the Park District philosophy. Um, it includes um, It includes uh, funding uh, through the voters, just like the original plan. And in fact, the vote was about the same, about 71%, 72% from the 1930s vote to the uh, 2008 vote. And so we passed a bond measure, and part of that bond measure was give money back to the local cities um, so they could improve their parks too. So they, they have a vested interest in our park system as well as their park system. So very important, uh, very successful. And fiscal responsibility, we manage our budget, we get awards for our budget, and that is always the thing that's the controversy, and I think it's the thing of squeezing the water out of the rocks and making sure that you, you manage the system properly. Continuing that effort, we're two full counties starting only in Alameda County originally and into por portions of Contra Costa County, but in the intervening years, spreading throughout from the San Francisco Bay all the way to the San Joaquin Delta. A population of about 2.7 million people in the East Bay and beautiful, diverse landscapes. Um, active and passive recreation for the enjoyment of the public who is paying for these parks. The educational value of interpretation, natural history, and history education is a core value for the system. And, and really continuing that uh, eastward expansion of our parks. We're, we're buying habitat corridors now as opposed to major recreation facilities, but we're still providing for the recreation needs of the residents of the East Bay. We've acquired over 10,000 acres just in the last two years. We, uh, looking at the future, the challenge you heard earlier from the state park system and climate change, as we're looking at with this drought in California, we may not have any water in our reservoirs uh, for recreation and for fisheries. The issue, but we have a huge demand. Shoreline erosion, we have 30 miles, over 30 miles of San Francisco Bay is in our regional parks in the East Bay, and we have spent the last uh, 40 years acquiring the shoreline and protecting wetlands and bird habitat and now development is built right up to those parks and shorelines. How are we going to protect those areas that may be underwater in the future? Big challenges. Um, the environmental education programs all the way into the Delta now, talking about water, talking about the Delta environment. 
is something we think is very important. Outreach into communities, talking to school kids, that, where's that connection to those next generations? So you heard a lot about that through the national parks and state parks today um, to promote the benefits of those parks, but to really re be relevant to the children. We are going to the schools. We are going to their events. We're going, we're even going to Children's Hospital, uh, a plan for the future. So uh, the other issue with climate change is fire, and fire is a very critical thing in the East Bay. You've heard, you I'm sure nationally knew about the huge rim fire in Yosemite. We had a fire in Mount Diablo, which is this is the fire. Um, we're going to see more fires, more frequent fires with climate change, and that's going to be very critical to the environment, and it's an impact to all parks, including uh, national parks and state parks. And we operate and maintain a, a police and fire department within our agency. And we really are looking at um, access through electronic media, uh, through our website, through connecting through apps. We have a lot going on like that that would to be relevant to the populations we're serving. Uh, providing online maps and access is critical to re out outreach to people who don't go to parks and get there. So we're doing a lot of those things. And uh, I go back to the original issue of Olmsted Senior, Olmsted Junior, Stephen Mather, about the importance of parks and health, mental and physical health. And you know we have a crisis in this country on, on diabetes, on obesity with kids, they're not getting outdoors. So we really are promoting that same value of parks are a place to be and get healthy and feel better and reduce stress. And partnerships, we have great volunteers. We have a foundation that is hosting the event tomorrow night. Um, our foundation does actual bus programs to get kids from urban areas, low-income kids, into our parks. They raise money for park projects that would not be funded through the tax base of normal operations. And so we get kids outdoors, uh, we provide camperships, so that is a critical element, not just because we should do it, because it's also how we be maintain relevancy to the populations that are in the East Bay paying for these parks. And I hope to find the next general manager somewhere in these groups, actually older, I need them older. Um, because we, need, we now have a huge turnover in all the park systems. National parks is about 50%. Our system is about 45%. State parks is about the same, where long-term park professionals are retiring, and we need new generations of people who look like the people we're serving to get interested in having a career serving the public in our parks. So I am, and governance, I think the other issue you can see are boards uh, then and now. But I think that was another big failure and controversy with the LA plan. And if somebody asked me today, why was the district, why has the district been so successful coming from such a modest plan? It's because our structure of governance was dedicated to parks and parks only. They're not in charge of the transportation system. They're not in charge of the county. They're not in charge of the city. They're an independently elected board that has one thing and one thing alone is to manage and push forward the, the voters. They represent their goals and objectives for moving forward on our master plan and serving them. And that has been, that continuity, like the Olmsteads in park planning, has been through, through 80 years of dedicated public service at, by boards elected in the East Bay for one purpose, and that's to make the best park system they can. So that's a very proud uh, lineage. This is a 1934 picture of Wildcat Creek, the first park that was proposed in the Olmsted plan. And I hope, uh, I hope this is relevant to what uh, things that you're doing. And uh, I will also say, as I said earlier, it is just really important that like Rockefeller, like uh, uh, the young man that spoke today on, on trying to create a national park, that we bring in the private sector as a partner, not so much to manage parks, 
to be a, be a partner in promoting parks and re fundraising for parks. And you heard that from the State Park Foundation. You heard that from National Parks. And you've heard it from me. The private-public partnership to find money, to encourage more money, uh, is critical still in the history of parks. And so every one of you knows somebody, and uh, you should ke keep them involved. I loved what uh, General Jackson said earlier. Go find somebody that doesn't normally go to the park and bring them in to go with you to go talk to a, a legislative leader or a leader in the community. We really need to expand the family of parks so we're not preaching to ourselves. So I hope this has uh, been beneficial. Thank you very much. Uh, our uh, task was to focus on the metropolitan scale, the regional scale of planning. And there seemed to me sort of four um, elements that point to success or lack of success. And the first is um, political leadership. And I, I would say political leadership connected to the business and civic elites. Uh, second, a, a strong academic connection. And what I didn't mention in the Boulder example was the strong linkage with the University of Colorado. Um, third, um, it was kind of implicit in both presentations uh, the role of the media. And finally, uh, sort of ongoing engagement by broad groups. Um, would you like to comment on, are those the right four? Are there more? Are there less? Uh, and from the perspective of these two great metropolitan areas, um, what, uh, what's your impression of those four? Well, um, I, I'll make one comment that relates to the, the political buy-in with the LA plan. The Chamber of Commerce is a default uh, governance body. I mean, it's a private entity. So it's not, the, the plan is run not through uh, governmental structures or um, regulatory bodies or the city council or the county supervisors. And it, it seems not to have occurred to them. Um, had, had, had it occurred to them, the chamber is exceedingly powerful in the pre-World War II era. Mm -hmm. Had it occurred to them, had they done it, or had they linked with uh, systems of governance in place on the landscape, we might have seen a different result. I mean, they really imagine themselves to be in competition with the city council, I mean, a competing body, and they wouldn't, they wouldn't want to cede any authority or any power that they had. And there was, no, you know, there was no academic institution involved with this at all. I mean, the chamber controlled it entirely. Um, so that is a big difference with these plans that we're looking at, or a distinct, distinction. So if I, you want I, a plan to work, don't get the movie stars, get the academics? <laughs> Uh, okay. No. Uh, well, I would just I would I would just say that um, I included the word luck. Um, I think a lot of luck. I think uh, planners and landscape architects have to have a little luck, and so do plans and vision, but also have to be prepared. And I think the Olmsteads are a really good example of disappointment. Not everything works out. You move on. And I think in our case, it was the decision that the water district did not want to run their own park agency. Mm -hmm had the water district under uh, George Pardee decided that they were going to run, they're going to keep that land and run their own park district because that was a proposal. Pardee rejected that. He says, no, we're in the business of, similar to some of the LA water issues, we're in the business of building dams and, wa and water and treating that water and getting in pipelines. We're not in the business of parks. And I have told my staff, had it not been for George Pardee running the water district, we today probably could have been somewhere in between the water department and the sewer department, and that's not where we wanted to be. Um, tell us about the elections that has happened from the very beginning up to the recent elections that your uh, district has held to get support from the community. Have they all been positive? No, not at all. I think uh, to, to be able to pass a a $3 million bond measure in the middle of the Depression uh, was pretty, pretty much a miracle. But again, I think those professors, those business leaders really were connected not just to the leadership or the elite of leadership. They really had a citizen movement going on. There were the thousand friends of parks that were created back then to help promote that bond measure. Uh, we were very successful in 1988 with our largest uh, 250 million, 200, 225 million, 
million dollar uh, bond measure. Uh, we had uh, a couple of tries at smaller bond measures. They did not pass. We passed another bond measure that just did it along the urban bay plain um, at our Measure CC, and then we just passed um, in 2008 the $500 million bond measure, yet again in another uh, recession. So overall, I'd say that the success is there. And my opinion is, as great as I think the, the board and the staff is, there's been that effort to maintain that connection to the public, and that goes back to the public relations side, the, the communication and education side. I think that's a critical element. There was a question here. Uh, hello, my, my name's Kelly Commerce from Los Angeles. I was wondering, um, this would be for Greg and Bill, if you can address what happened with the Greater Los Angeles Citizens Committee why they didn't pick up the ball, so to speak, on this plan um, before the war ended, and then how you see the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy and the LA River organizations fitting into this Olmstead plan. Well, I mean, when we were talking about 1930, we were saying there wasn't a governance or they didn't try to, to create the governance structure to do something like this. But today, actually, with these smaller groups, um, if, we can, if we can get them to work together, so you're not gonna have a countywide governance body that's gonna be just for parks and playgrounds and beaches, I don't think, right? But if you, if you, can, if you can aggregate up these, these, these there's, a, there's this whole cluster of organizations that are either working on a particular kind of project or a particular site. But if we get them all working together, you can actually have an umbrella or an aggregate or scaling up from those smaller, uh, you know, the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy, the Rivers and Mountains Conservancy, FOLAR, all these other groups. If all the groups like that could come together and create some kind of overarching organization and aggregate up all the things that they're doing at, at the site-specific or the type-specific or the, or the project-specific scale, you might actually have something that would do it. It's not going to come from SCAG. It's not going to come from anything like that. I think it might, but that might be one possibility. Yeah, and I, I just would go back to one thing I said uh, in my remarks there that um, a lot of the collaborative efforts that may rise out of LA Basin or LA County may be watershed specific too. With the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy, hugely important, no doubt, and interested in watershed uh, maintenance. And, but um, the San Gabriel River Conservancy, the Friends of the Los Angeles River, um, the various entities that are now uh, doing recreational boating on the Los Angeles River, the Santa Ana and the Rio Hondo as you move south across the basin, the watershed collaborative efforts that stretch to the entire basin may become the focal point for a lot of, well, have become the yeah. focal point for a lot of innovative environmental thinking and planning. But health and parks, for instance, diminishing, you know, thinking regionally about pollution and things like that as well. We have a question right here. Yeah, I had a question for you about eucalyptus. You mentioned eucalyptus, <laughs> you mentioned fire, we've talked about environment. You haven't talked about invasive species, but it's not a native species. What as you plan the parks in the East Bay and other places in California <clears throat> and in the metropolitan areas, what do you do with eucalyptus trees? Maybe I'll start with that. Um, we have a few eucalyptus trees in the East Bay. So uh, for those of you that don't know, there was an effort, actually people got paid to plant s sapling eucalyptus trees throughout the watershed land. Uh, they were gonna make money off it, it didn't, didn't work and it's a huge fire hazard. Um, this has been a controversy for many decades. Um, the Oakland Hills fire, uh, 3,000 houses burnt down, people lost their lives, really kind of changed that dynamic. The district has completed a plan for managing the fuel for about uh, 35 miles of the East Bay Ridge Lines. Um, the problem with that plan is, one, we got sued by both sides, uh, but we, we, and we made compromises. We made compromises to do that. Uh, but the economic cost of doing that entire plan, we're spending about $2 million a year or something like that on that. Now, that's coming out of our, you know, we're getting some grants, but that's, that's a future permanent cost that will grow. So we, we're never going, and people say, well, if you cut down the trees, you have to manage it for fire forever. If you thin the trees, you have to manage it for fire forever. Um, and you need to spend more money on it and do one of those two things. And, and from my standpoint is anything we do in this good plan to reduce that fire and open up some areas to natural uh, regeneration of native plants is a good thing. But what most people don't understand is the scale of that is massively huge. 
you know, we'd be in the position of state parks of closing parks to fund uh, what we really have to do that way. So we have prioritized literally the hot spots and where we can thin, where we can eliminate uh, eucalyptus trees. It's just a huge, huge area. The Oakland Hills fire that burned down the, the 3,000 houses only stopped because of the wind change. It was about to hit more eucalyptus and old pine, planted Monterey pine. And if it would have gone that direction, it would have not stopped. Uh, it's just the wind that changed it, not the firefighters. So it really, it's a, really a big threat, and it's a huge burden on a park system that's trying to manage parks for habitat and for people. We're, you know, we're in this huge uh, effort to try to reduce fuel and still doing it within a budget that we can manage. Yeah, we, um, I'm involved in doing a new campus plan, and we met two days ago, and one of the ideas is to plant more native plants across campus and do a prescribed burn. Uh, that didn't go over too well. With, uh, so there's a question. Yeah, we're um, talking about metropolitan regions and, and acknowledging that uh, the infrastructure that supports metropolitan regions actually stretches far beyond the boundaries. I know many Los Angelinos don't necessarily know much about the Owens Valley where they get a big percentage of their water. And there's a recent survey uh, of the Bay Area that 70-some uh, percent of people didn't even know where the Delta was, which was just outside of our, our area. I'm, I'm wondering what role uh, parks and landscape architecture can really play to connect the metropolitan area, uh, the large population centers with, uh, with the source of their, uh, their drinking water and, and, and more increasingly their energy. Uh, one of the best examples in the United States is actually New York City, which um, has tremendous drinking water and they use the ecosystem services concept to, and, and a lot of work with um, up the Hudson River with uh, rural communities to convince them to um, sell development rights and so on for uh, water quality. Uh, I'll just throw in a New York example of oh, yeah. what these guys are thinking. Uh, in the Los Angeles context, um, as we do more and more with the Los Angeles River watershed in particular, um, the opportunities there for planners and landscape architects and academics and the public activist uh, advocacy communities, et cetera, to uh, highlight really three riparian systems that are critical to Los Angeles, the Los Angeles River, the Owens River, and the Colorado River, um, all three different distribution uh, vehicles by which Los Angeles and Los Angeles County are watered. And so um, as we see more public access, public awareness, public art, uh, even performance art, perform uh, activities within and beyond those riparian watersheds and landscapes. That's a real learning tool for greater Los Angeles. And um, certainly now in the school, um, the school environments, K through 12, you see a greater awareness of the water sources of Los Angeles uh, amongst the kids. And just to pick up on that, I mean, histories of these institutions and agencies would be really critical as well. I don't know why somebody hasn't written a great history of the MWD, for instance. I, I would also raise the question back again, which is what would Olmsted think, Senior think about this, because the whole idea of, of serving an industrial, industrialized, industrializing nation, um, the first thing that's going to get cut off in our system is those places where people don't have a lawn, don't have a swimming pool, the lower income people who go to our parks to have relief from the heat or recreation, they're going to get cut off equally to farmers because when we try to say, well, that, that really isn't a, a fair thing for people who don't have uh, access to water recreation of any kind, we get, you know, we're being told, well, you know, the, the farmers in the valley are lay, laying off thousands of workers, so we're not going to compete with that. But it is an interesting issue of, of social fairness for people who don't have, it's the same issue again, those people who don't have big landscapes or, or big places to, to have open space next to them. You know, how do we, how do we make that fair? Um, I think conservation is still the key. I know that there's been a lot of effort talked about uh, saline plants, desalinization. Uh, we're finding out some of those plants that have been built, they're, not, they're so expensive. Um, there'd be far more to maintain, it'd be far more pragmatic to really get people to really think about the water they're drinking every day. I always think about when you brush your teeth, when you're growing up, how often did you leave the water on while you're brushing your teeth and how much good water is going down the drain? I bet you lots of kids still leaving the tap on out there.
but I think it's going to be critical for uh, Western states and California to really change how they view water. That, I, that's really the, um, certainly I think that it's a really major issue and that in Texas, um, our drought uh, resulted in the loss of 10% of our trees, which is between 300 wow. million and 500 million trees. Wow. And um, Texas is well known for not planning, uh, but there is a Texas water plan that devotes 20% of $2 billion that was passed in a bond issue last year to conservation. Now, I think the challenge for landscape architects in particular is what does that mean? What are, what are water conserving landscapes and how do you, um, how do you design it? There's a question in the back. I think there's, well, there's two. There's two people have both wanted to, and one person over here. Can they all be short yes, no kind of questions? And I'm sorry, it's my fault for talking about taxes. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to state my question very briefly. Um, you're talking right now about water in California, and we've also talked about trees. And uh, I live in San Francisco, actually, and I have some trees in my backyard. And uh, um, increasingly, I'm becoming, I'm actually letting my trees not be watered this year, and one of them is going to die. And uh, in San Francisco, there, uh, even five years ago, there was a huge push to plant more trees. Uh, traditionally, San Francisco didn't have trees. So I, I'm interested in, as we talk about water, and we're also, we were had the, I mean, there are parts of California with redwoods. But that's actually not the majority of California. So is there anybody looking at the tree issue and what instead would be the appropriate landscaping if, in fact, we can't support trees any longer? Um, I, in the interest of time, and since there was someone else uh, wanting to ask the question, I would say we'll try to respond to you afterwards. And, yeah. Yes, so the question I have is, um, What's great about today's uh, talks is that looking at the Olmsteads lets us look at things across many scales from national parks to state to regional and so on. One thing we're seeing um, in the metropolitan context is that we have more national parks and state parks in extremely urban areas. And I think citizens have expectations of parks that are in their neighborhoods um, of, of uses that are urban uses or even neighborhood uses. Um, and yet national, state, city parks have very different regulatory re regimes, uh, design guidelines, trash can styles. Um, and so the, the problems or the tensions between conservation and recreation, between habitat and, um, uh, habitat and social uses, they play out differently across these different kinds of parks. And yet from the user point of view, just as uh, uh, wildlife doesn't necessarily respect boundaries. You know, ordinary park users don't really care so much who's managing the park, they, but they know how they want to use it. And I'm wondering if you all have thoughts on how that plays out and is there a way um, that the, the needs of, of users, both animal and human, can be managed in a more coordinated way when there are all these uh, jurisdictional questions where very different kinds of parks are often side by side. Could I ask the panelists to respond to both questions and you know, try to be, if you can do both native, the trees and the, the different the scales tree. of parks. Okay. Tree, tree and water in one minute. Jared Farmer and tree people. Yeah, Jared Farmer is an historian who's just written a book called Trees in Paradise, which is a cultural and political analysis of California by reference to four tree species across the state. And tree people is exceedingly important environmental advocacy and activist organization in Los Angeles. So I, I think just for some context, for, for some context is that for the national, the, the creation of the GGNRA uh, and Bill Mott uh, was part of that being director at the time was a very controversial thing within the National Park Service. They really did not embrace it. Um, it was also controversial that it didn't get funded through the normal process. It had to be self-funding. It's turned out to be a roaring success. I think now the national park system really embraces it as one of their greatest achievements in, it's, I think, exceeding Yosemite Valley now in use. The state parks had the same problem. They really did not want to get into the urban park. park. And it's for those reasons that there are more conflicts with dogs and people, wildlife and people, uh, bikes and people. And so uh, we are an urban park system that uh, has evolved with taking on those challenges. And it's never easy. And they're going to increase, just like climate change is going to compact more people along the shoreline onto those parks. 
So it's just, it's a, something you have to address from a management and a good science perspective. And re realizing again that the, the language was enjoyment by the public as well as conservation. What a great panel. Thank them, William.